Thank you, Anton, for these nice words. Uh, as you correctly guessed, they will speak more about structural proof theory than about resource analysis. But but if you get bored at any point, that's fine. I can just switch. Um, <laughs> okay, so the main thing here is in the subtitle. Um, I'll try to explain what the absolute calculus is good for, in particular uh, on looking for bounds, upper bounds, and their complexity. And the new thing here, or sort of new thing, is that we take care of the case where we have equality signs in the language. That's joint work with Kenji. Good. So let me try to start to explain the title, or let me start by trying to explain the title. So I think everybody knows what the hypercomplexity is, but let me start with the motivation, which I take from a recent paper by Matthias Bartz, Alex Leitch, and Anila Lodic. Um, and they start the paper with the following claim. The optimal calculation of hybrid disjunction from unformalized to formalized mathematical proofs is one of the most prominent problems in proof theory first or logic. So let's just accept this claim and try to figure out what the hybrid disjunction is. Well, I think as everybody knows here, if we have a poorly extensional formula, uh, uh, there exists an x or a vector of x of e of x, and we can actually prove this in first logic with some proof pi, then we know there exists a tautology of instances of the formula E, and this tautology we call hybrid disjunction. And the interesting thing is, well, at least in this context, the interesting thing is to give a bound on this length of this disjunction on this n here. And we call this length n of the shortest hyperbolic disjunction the hyperbolic complexity. And uh, what Bartz et al. tried to say with this, with this claim is that they th observe that even for very complicated proofs, um, the hyperbolic disjunction can be actually quite small. So in analysis of proof we look at, um, it we have a very complicated proof, we have a very complicated statement. Actually, the case distinctions are quite small, are, are small numbers, and you can conceive the hybrid disjunction is just a big case disjunction over the whole proof. So the, the problem here would be to figure out how to bound this hybrid complexity. Okay, that's You're, the first just thing. A, a question? Yeah. Uh, sure. so, okay, so firstly, I, I presume the TIM, you mean TIN? No, 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 no. TIM, are the instances of the bound variables x1 to xm. And then we have a big disjunction over all these i's here. Right, I see. Okay. Um, and you're trying to bound the n in terms of the size of a proof. Exactly. Okay. And, and I try to have as few dependencies on pi as possible. Very, thanks a lot for the interruption. I forgot to say, please do interrupt me. I mean, these online talks are very strange. I don't see the audience. You cannot yell at me during the talk. So please yell at me uh, via, via the, um, the voice functionality so they can stop. Um, and sorry, what, what is pi again? P pi is- Pi is uh, some name for the proof. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I will explain these notations in a, in a minute. It just, just means a predicate calculus. So first, the logic proves this accidental statement with a proof pi. Okay? Yep. Cool. Any, yeah, I think that's okay. So what is the absolute calculus now? Well, the absolute calculus is the formalization of logic without quantifiers. Instead, we use the absolute operator. What's the absolute operator? Well, it's a term forming operator which transforms a formula A of X into a term, a so called epsilon term, epsilon X AX. It's an indefinite description. So, its semantics means that this term um, for some uh, states for some X, so for some um, uh, instance X, for which the formula A of X is true. We this term forming operator, we can get rid of quantifiers. Particularly, we can get rid of the extensional quantifiers, but we can also define the universal quantifiers. So we transform all the quantifier complexity on to, uh, to a complexity of the term level, of the term structure. What are the axioms of the absent calculus? We have all tautologies, we have the quality axioms, and we have the so-called critical axioms, which govern well, the 
interpretation or meaning of the epsilon term, namely if the formula A of T holds, then also the formula where we have replaced T with this indefinite description holds. Okay. And we can conceive thus an epsilon proof as simply a tautology, which takes as assumption all the critical axioms that we used in this proof. So all these things in red here. And as conclusion, well, the actual end formula that we want to prove, if we have replaced all the quantifiers in there with corresponding epsilon terms, so we map this first order formula to this, well, quantifier free formula, but containing these epsilon terms. So in some sense, the proofs are very simple, or the, the, the concept of proof is very simple. We have just tautologies, and we only have to find the correct uh, critically axioms to make sure that this is actually a tautology. So this may have to make some sense in formalizing or in formalization. And indeed, we find a theory in, in Isabel Hall, uh, which has a sum i operator to represent Hilbert's epsilon operator. So like you, when you say tautologies, you mean some sort of like quantifier free formulas, that are theorems? Yes, so in this case here, I just meant tautology uh, in the standard sense of proposition logic. You're right, I have equality axioms here as well. So I mean, I said actually quasi tautologies, where I have tautologies modulo the quality theory. Okay, but this is, this isn't, the point is this is effective. Uh, you can decide. This. Yes, yes, certainly, yes. yes. Well, okay. uh, this, this thing here is decidable, but of course, finding the correct critical axioms is not decidable. Right, so all the proof search is reduced to the search for the critical uh, axioms. Precisely. Great. Good, but coming back to proof search, we'll see. Okay, so what will happen in the next uh, 40 minutes or so? First of all, I will try to motivate why you should bother, or perhaps you don't want to bother, then, then also a goal achieved. And then I will present two results, namely how we can use this um, famous or infamous calculus to bound the hyper complexity in the case that we have a language with equality sign and also if we have something called absolute equality and I will explain in a moment what this means. Okay, so let's start with the motivation or the thing about why bother. Well, actually that's the first calculus we know to do proof theory in. So Hilbert phrased his program in the absolute calculus and it was kind of the calculus used in the 1920s. So the original work in proof theory was considered absent calculus, mainly not for first logic as we have just, as we will, as, as I'm, as I'm uh, leading to, but for um, uh, piano arithmetic or number theory. And in particular, Ackermann falsely proved consistency of analysis using the absent calculus in his PhD thesis. Um, well, he then had uh, some wisdom and included um, a footnote right at the beginning, which restricted the analysis, uh, restricted the, the, the formal system to something which is where the analysis was actually correct, but in principle that what he wanted to do. Chrysler has then used the absent calculus um, and the absent substitution method to uh, formulate and phrase his no counter example interpretation. And later on, Toshi, Arai, Michael, uh, and, and Jeremy Avigat, Mint, and Tate have used or thought about using the absence substitution map as an alternative for order analysis. And recently, we see renewed interest in structural proof theory using the absence calculus by guys like Jeremy uh, Askeri, Bartz, et al. Okay, and I think Tom, I saw at least in um, uh, in the participation list, so he may want to comp to, to say something here or complain about it, mentioning him here. Okay, so that was the timeline. Now, why have you never heard of it? Perhaps you have heard of it, but why is it not exactly that famous? Well, let's look at an embedding, so a translation of a simple existential formula into the language of the Epsilon calculus. So we have something very simple, three, quant three existential quantifier, Sigma, not, not, not even a sigma one statement because we don't have any theory, but, but something simple. And that's what comes out. Okay, so we see a horrible term. And frankly, I have no clue whether this term is actually correct. 
or this, this, this formula is actually correct. I, I copied it from the, from the paper I cited earlier by, by Matthias and others, um, ho hoping that they used some machine translation for this embedding and hoping that my typesetting was correct. So it's obviously very cumbersome to work with these things. And that has motivated people to think about alternative ways to uh, represent formalized epsilon calculus. And in particular, that's the main motivation of the paper I've mentioned from the very beginning. But here I want to emphasize a different uh, motivation, a different view of the thing. So this looks co completely opaque and unreadable, exactly like this. So what you see here is a fragment of uh, the bytecode, uh, LLVM bytecode of a C program. The C program is actually doing something very nice. I mean, it's a calculator. It's a calculator that comes from that is, this comes from a very nice grammar. So it, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice program actually. But if you translate it to machine readable language, it of course becomes unreadable and, 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 and this un, um, unacceptable to humans. But the point of the bytecode is, of course, that we don't read it as a human, we generate it automatically and we do stuff with it. So having such a bytecode is very, very um, convenient um, in, in the area of, of compiling or pre-compiling um, where we want to link this, this compiled or this intermediate language to other languages. So perhaps we should conceive the Epsilon calculus as some sort of intermediate language, intermediate representation, where we don't really look into the code, we don't really look into these, these term expressions here, but we use it for something completely different, namely we know such a term representation exists, we can automatically generate it from the original formula, this one here, sorry, um, and then we learn interesting properties for example, about the structural proof um, from this intermediate representation. Good. Sorry, Georg, just mm -hmm. a, a naive question. The translation sure. from a quantified formula to an epsilon calculus formula, is this blows up exponentially or something? Oh, boof. Boof. I, I think it's polynomial. Should be not too difficult. Uh, this, this we'll will, what's see the degree or constants in front of this polynomial because this is quite a blow up. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. But you mean size wise? Yes, size wise, I, it's, it's an exponential. I was thinking about the time of the actual translation. So the number of steps we need to do to do that. Not Sorry, this, time is, must be bound by the size of the output, surely. Uh, um, Right, I meant number of steps that we do, not counting the the actual. Oh, you're right. Yes, like the tree. Aspect. You're talking about the yes. depth of the tree. I was talking about depth of the tree. Yes, yeah. Okay. But you see, we can discuss this further. We see the, the embedding in a moment. Okay. Okay. Good. So, in any way, it's computable. Fair enough. Good, so let me be a bit more precise on the calculus. So we start with all proposition tautologies. We throw in the standard representation of equality. So functional and functional reflexivity axioms. Um, then we add the critical axioms that we see have seen before. Then we add to this, the so-called absent equality axioms, which will main, well, to some extent, interest us um, and they mean that if we have s that s equals t then we have also that we can replace in this epsilon term this argument s with the argument t here in this epsilon term and then those two terms have to be the same so it tells us something about an um, uh, an equality of these two sort of choice function or indefinite indefinite operators um, in the descriptions if we change the arguments of these descriptions. Okay, so it should be clear that this axiom is not really, um, well, it's, it, it has some interesting properties, let's put it this way. Okay, then we have still here an elementary calculus, so we don't have any quantifiers yet. Then we throw into this the substitution instances of quantifier rules. Um, and we call this the axioms of the predicate calculus. And if we add all together, 
then we have critical axioms and absolute equality axioms. Then we call this the axioms of uh, the predicate calculus with epsilon and epsilon equality. What are my proofs? I'm not going to speak a lot about how we proof in this system because essentially we do use or we, we, we have everything given from the axioms um, and we use just a Hilbert type representation because it's the easiest to, to think about and the complexity doesn't come from the proof as we will see in a moment but from the presence of these critical axioms and absent equality axioms. So that's just for notation. With EC, I mean the elementary calculus, the name goes back to Hilbert and Bernays. Uh, so essentially, granted tautologies. And with this EC equality and epsilon, I mean this elementary calculus extended with critical axioms plus this epsilon equality axioms. And with PC, I just mean first order logic. Okay. And as before, we write this notation. For example, EC epsilon proofs with a proof pi formula A, if I want to say that in this Hilbert type formalization, you have a proof of A. Good, the size of a proof is just a number of steps and a critical count is the number of distinct critical formulas, epsilon equality axioms and quantifier axioms in the proof, plus one. Forget about the plus one. So what we mean is it's just for technical reasons, I only count the things which contain epsilons, or which are axioms for the epsilon calculus, or quantifiers. I don't count any propositional steps. So is, um, Jörg, are you, you say distinct formulas, do you mean uh, occurrences, or do you really mean uh, distinct formulas? Uh, uh, you mean, I One mean... of the proof has multiple occurrences of a distinct, of a critical formula. I mean distinct formulas. So okay. not occurrences. So, so in particular, the critical count could be much more succinct than the proof. Yes. I will, okay. We will see an example of this in a moment. Okay? okay. So how do we represent quantifiers? Well, we have seen this already. Epsilon x, the existing x, a of x is just a of epsilon x, a x. And the universal quantifier comes from dualization. So we have then kind of the epsilon which cannot, which would, so the, 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 um, the witness of the negation of the formula and the formula has to be true even for the negation of the formula. It gets to be, to, to, it's, it requires some thought to understand that this is really correct. But if you don't like this formula, you can just assume that we would have a different term forming operator for the universal quantifiers, okay? so. For the moment, just assume or just accept that we can represent these quantifiers. And now I'm going to define this mapping. So for terms and variables of the, the mapping is just the identity and the mapping of an absent term is also just the identity. Same for, so not same, but for atoms, we just apply it recursively. Now the same holds for the young to, uh, for implication, disjunction, conjunction, and negation. And for the quantifiers, we do exactly what I just proposed. We map an existential formula to the translation of the formula where we instantiate X with this corresponding epsilon term. And here we would have the translation for the universal quantifier. We would have the mapping of the formula, and here we have the uh, epsilon x, the, the expression epsilon x, not a uh, of x. Okay. Now we can prove that we can embed any first order proof into this elementary epsilon calculus without increase <clears throat> in the critical count. And there's a guy called Richard Zach and also myself who proved this some or more than 10 years ago and everything is fine with this proof except that it's wrong. Um, and the reason it is wrong is that we need one crucial um, assumption about the proof, namely it has to be regular. That means that the eigenvariables in our proof are unique. Otherwise the proof just doesn't work. How come? because we will replace strong quantifier inferences by substituting the eigenvariables with the corresponding epsilon terms. Now, if the eigenvariables are repeatedly used, then this doesn't work. That was spotted actually by a student of, um, uh, from, Star from Darmstadt um, by, um, um, who 
who's I'm very sorry whose who's name I forgot um, and later and then uh, we emph emphasized by Michel Barigo and eventually we managed to, to actually repair, to observe this bug and repair it. But sorry, can the point I ask just to be sure um, that I understand this. So when you rename the eigenvariables in order to make them distinct, Mm -hmm. Is it the case that then the critical count of pi will grow because then formulas which have previously equal and only counted once become distinct critical axioms and I counted several times? So is, is that the issue or I mean, um, what, what is the... that, that, so what happens, so what, you, what we can do is we can translate every uh, sequence like proof in a tree like proof and in a tree like proof this renaming is very easy. Uh, that gives you polynomials a blow up in the in the size. It's an old result by Krajic and Budlak. Actually, by, I think by Krajic, a young Krajic. Um, and so we can, with the polynomial increase in the size, um, transform any non-regular proof into a regular proof. I don't know whether we have we could get some better bound on the uh, on the critical count. So I remember we have a blow up in size. I expect back that we will also have a blow up in the critical count. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Georg, it's, it's mm -hmm. not clear to me that um, Krajicek's method will only produce a polynomial blow up here because you are in predicate logic. So you will also have to introduce quantifiers to close the previous formulas. And then that could also re um, result in an exponential explosion translating to epsilon calculus. Really? No, 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 oh, no. But so, I'm sorry, your input is a predicate calculus. My, my, I, I'm yes. starting with predicate calculus. So there is sorry, no, no epsilon what's going going on whatsoever. Sure, sorry, okay. that should be fine. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, good to know. So, but there's another thing here, namely the way I've axiomatized or formalized the predicate calculus is that it includes equality, right? So when I phrase this lemma like this, I mean that it also works um, for the case where we have the equality sign in our language. And that's the new result that, that Kenji essentially proof the country myself uh, came up that that we can use the same embedding result also in the presence of equality with exactly the same assumption of regularity and the same bound on the critical count so we can just use the proof that we know for the case without equality that Richard and myself have done some yeah, some time ago and that's actually the original proof from Hilbert and Bernas if we think a bit better about the case of equality so let me just make an example of this mapping. Here we have a simple um, uh, first order formula and we want to translate it into the epsilon calculus. So we apply this mapping. For that, we have to, first of all, to get rid of this outermost external quantifier by substituting for this X, the corresponding epsilon term. Well, of course we have to map also this formula and this formula to the epsilon calculus. So what is the mapping of this formula well, then we have to replace this universal quantifier in here. We would get the formula P of X or Q of epsilon Y, not Q Y. So this epsilon term E1 here inside. Then we do this mapping. So we place this thing here with this result of this translation. We get this, uh, this, this formula here. And then we do the substitution for X. Here we have a new epsilon term E2 and this small epsilon term E1 is kind of embedded into the larger one. And we get as final result, this horrendous formula, which is of course a lot less readable than the one that we have seen in the beginning. And that's what exactly I emphasized in the very beginning of the talk. Okay. Now, why would we want to use this bytecode? Suppose we have here a sequence calculus representation of uh, proof of the Drinker's paradox. So there is an X, P of X implies for Y, P of Y. Okay, um, I don't think I need to go through the proof. What I want to do now is I want to use this embedding on this proof and see how the epsilon calculus and this, this formalism allows us to compress this proof. So that will be the translation of this formula in epsilon calculus, where this epsilon term here would be this epsilon term that represents this outermost extension quantifier. Now let's just do this translation or this uh, substitution for this formula that exists in X and so on, or for the actual Drinker's paradox in this formula, we can get this. Um, so far, this is just a replacement of 
formulas per formulas. Now we have to get rid of this universal quantifier in the corresponding mapping. So this would be this universal quantifier. Again, I just replaced the uh, expression for all y, py everywhere in the proof. And let's see what is missing so that we can repair this proof. Well, uh, first of all, we have to repair this step here. So this here we have an axiom and suddenly we have, instead of this A, uh, an epsilon term. So let's, let's just replace this eigenvalue A here with the epsilon term. And there's somebody writing the chap. Okay, Arnold has to leave. Goodbye, Arnold. Good. So um, we have just instantiated an eigenvariable. So nothing big is happening. Okay, so the only step now, which is not a valid step, is this one here. Here we have an axiom, and suddenly we have essentially the end formula of my proof. So what we have done here is we have applied employed this implication, which happens to be a critical action. If I rewrite this slightly, I see that this whole proof, okay, this whole proof, I mean, it was a drinker's paradox, uh, uh, the, the drinker's uh, paradox proof is not really that big, but we can compress it in essentially just one use of a critical action. Two things are important here. We have compressed the proof, so it's smaller now, fine. Second is, this is obviously a classical principle. Can anybody spot the use of the excluded middle in this proof? So it's built in the way we phrase the epsilon terms, namely what the epsilon calculus is doing, it's incorporating quantifier shifts, which are only valid classically, which are not, which would be otherwise we would have to do properly. Okay, so that also explains why the Epsilon calculus is not that fashionable for non-classical logics. So some remarks or kind of conclusions of this. So the Epsilon calculus allows us proof compression, essentially or mainly due to quantifier shifts. Uh, the propositional inference and structural rules become irrelevant. The only thing we have to focus on is these critical axioms here, and we can focus on quantifier inference. And actually we can use this bytecode idea uh, in another paper by, Aguilera, uh, paper by Aguilera et al, where they have used, well, not exactly the absent calculus, but ideas from the absent calculus to show how unsound inference can make the proof shorter. And these uh, as unsound proof inferences are only locally unsound. In general, we have soundness and they achieve this just exploiting quantifier shifts, which come from the idea of the absent calculus. Okay, good. So that kind of should conclude uh, why you could bother or could be interested in this, or at least why I am interested in. And now I want to explain these two results I have been goading you about. Namely, first, we want to look at the epsilon calculus with equality. So where we only focus on the language where we have the equality sign and use this calculus or this, this bytecode thing to bound the hyperbolic complexity. So first, let me give you the extended first epsilon theorem, where we don't have yet epsilon equality axioms, but we can have standard equality in the language. So we have a quantifier for formula, we have some epsilon terms, S1 to Sm, which we instantiate these free variables with, and then we prove the formula E of S1 to Sm in the epsilon calculus. So we use the elementary epsilon calculus here because that's all we need. And from this, we can conclude the existence of a big disjunction of instances of um, uh, these formulas E, where we have replaced these terms S1 to Sm with fresh terms T1, Tm, and indexed uh, with this I. So we have this junction of all these indices. And that's provable in the elementary calculus. And you can think of this as this of a tautology or quasi-tautology, because the only thing we use here are propositional tautologies and equality axioms. Now that's not that interesting. That is more interesting. Namely, we can now bound this length of this disjunction with some non-elementary formula. Okay, that's clear. Depending only on the critical count of the original proof. 
So not depending on the size of the proof, not depending on the proof itself, depending only on the quantify inferences in there. And that's of course um, exactly, okay, come back to Hebron theorem in a moment. So I just, we emphasize, so the number of instances, um, so this length of this junction is independent of the propositional inferences in this proof. Only takes into account the quantifier inferences. Now, as a straight corollary, we get Hebron theorem, and actually Hebron theorem was first properly proven in the book by Hebron and Bernays. We have an extension formula as before. We prove this extension formula in the predicate calculus. And then there are terms um, such that we obtain this Hebron disjunction as before. And phrased in our languages means that the elementary calculus or this proposition logic with equality can prove this disjunction. And again, we have this bound on the, on the Hebron disjunction or on the length of the Hebron disjunction or more precisely, we have now an upper bound on the Hebron complexity, which is independent on the number of propositional inferences as it should be. Hebron theorem tells us how we can get rid of quantifiers and naturally we use this or how we achieve this is instantiating quantifiers uh, with suitable terms and building a huge case disjunction, uh, case, um, uh, uh, case distinction over this. And the length of this case distinction should not depend on the propositional structures, uh, propositional inferences, but only on the quantifiers that we used in this proof. We can generalize this proof to, or this argument to even allow critical axioms in the proof that we start with, then we can have some kind of a conservative result, um, namely that we can get rid of this indefinite, inst uh, uh, indefinite constructions um, that represent the epsilon term in this proof and come up with a proof which is based in this proposition language where we have a proof of a big disjunction. Okay. Good. Any questions so far? Because now I'm trying to give you a glimpse at the proof of this. Good. First, as a third result, I want to give a corollary exploiting some early ideas by Parikh. We have exactly the same setup as in Hebron theorem. And then we can actually not only bound the lengths of this disjunction, but also the term complexity of these instances. So we can find the primitive recursive function G and epsilon free terms Tij, such that this big disjunction is provable. And the depth of these terms that we have used as witnesses is bounded by this primitive recursive function in the critical count of the original proof and the logical degrees or the logical structure of this end formal that we had here. How do we do this? We use an, a unification argument um, where we just abstract the proof that we have here by replacing all the variable, all the terms by fresh variables. And then as we have here, essentially tautology can use an old argument by Parikh um, to make sure that the term depth of the, inst of the terms is actually not too, doesn't grow too big. Similar argument has been done by Krajic and Pudlak. It's, for example, written up in the handbook of mathematical uh, of, of proof theory. Okay. Now, let us try to, or let me try to prove this first epsilon theorem where we ignore the case for equality. So the, the uh, things with equality become slightly more complicated. Um, and just the, the phrasing is, is just for this case where we have. Okay, we can we can have equality, but we don't have absolute equality. So, and we make it even simpler because we don't prove the fir extended first epsilon theorem, but only the epsilon theorem. Then maybe we have an end formal which doesn't contain epsilon terms. So we don't get a disjunction, but just get a proof without critical axioms. So we prove that we can derive the formula E uh, in the elementary calculus by an induction on a term measure of the original proof. And we assume that the proof doesn't contain any free variables and just we can replace these free variables by constants. The main idea is that if we have a proof of A um, in the absolute calculus, um, 
And E is a critical epsilon term. Um, so an epsilon term, which is governed by critical axioms of maximal term measure, then we can find a new proof um, of the same formula where this new proof has a smaller term measure. So we have we got rid of some of the epsilon terms. Uh, at least we get rid of the epsilon, critical epsilon term of maximal measure. How does this lemma work? Um, suppose AT1 implies AE, ATN implies E are all the critical formulas which belong to this epsilon term E. So all these critical axioms that we have seen before will govern this epsilon term. They may have different witnesses, but they have the same epsilon term in the conclusion. Now, then we uh, do a actually quite simple trick. Uh, we assume that well, we consider all each individual of these implications and we obtain for each ti a derivation of E from the assumption that ATI holds, okay? Um, but assuming ATI, these axioms here become tautologies or hence can be derived without the use of any epsilon uh, derivations. And we can derive this proof here without using the, this critical axioms that we had before. So how do we do this? We replace the epsilon term E everywhere by TI. Every critical formula AT implies AE belonging to E turns into a formula B implies ATI, where we have just changed this thing here. And um, the formula E here is replaced, uh, the term E here is replaced by the term TI. Now we add ATI as an axiom, as we want to imply, prove this implication. So we actually can replace this critical axiom by this tautology, as I said before, and we get the proof that we want. So these are now n proofs for these n witnesses t1 to tn. Um, so we can uh, uh, have these inferences already. Now, on the other hand, we can assume the negation of the witness formulas and use a big conjunction to prove um, the conjunction of not ATI implies E. As follows, we add this assumption to the axioms. Then again, the critical axioms become derivable. Then we get new proof pi prime. Now we have N plus one proofs that we combine with a big case disjunction and we get eventually a proof of the N formula E. So this way we have, re we have replaced a very complicated epsilon term by doing substitutions. That's the first step. If you use a sense of proof measure, you can repeatedly apply this operation to get rid of all these epsilon terms, but just substitute. Okay. Now, if we do have epsilon terms in our end formula, then this repeated uh, process of substituting, of course, will change these epsilon terms and we will not get the end formula back that we had in the beginning, but we'll get a big disjunction of all these instances of the end form. And if we do the complex now of we, we look carefully at the proof, we can find this non-elementary bound that I claimed before. So to recap, suppose the end formula does not contain epsilon uh, does contain epsilon terms, then the absolute elimination method produces a broad disjunction of E by construction. And what falls out from the proof is a interdependency only on the critical count. Good, I think I should speed up a bit. Um, Anton, how much time do I have? I don't hear you. You're still muted. Ah, sorry. So usually about 10 minutes, but if you need a bit more then that, that's also fine. Okay, 10 minutes, I think. Let's say, let's say 11. Yes. Okay, good. So as a corollary, we obtain Hebron theorem where we just is combine the result that we have seen with the embedding that we can embed a rich proof in the first, in first logic into the epsilon calculus. And I have even more time because I got lots of questions in between. Good, okay. So that was the first result, namely that we can 
get exactly the same result that we had for the epsilon calculus uh, without the quality, even in the presence that we have an equality sign. Now, why has this been so complicated to achieve? This sounds very simple. Well, in the original proof by Hilbert and Berners, it was kind of obvious or clear to everybody that we need additional axioms if uh, for the epsilon terms, if we have equality in the language. And if we have this axiom, things become more complicated. So let me um, briefly emphasize these axioms. So we have the epsilon calculus with epsilon equality. And we call an epsilon term epsilon x, ax, and epsilon matrix if the only terms that occur in these terms as arguments are free variables. And those occur at uh, once, uh, occur linearly, uh, occur, occur only once each. Now, for, with this notion, we can define um, the epsilon equality axioms, namely the corresponding axiomatization. Uh, the, uh, is the elementary calculus plus the critical formulas plus these equality axioms where we say that s equals t with this epsilon term where s is in this argument equals this epsilon term where t is in this argument where this thing here is action epsilon matrix. So it's a function of a particular form. Namely, we can instantiate all these terms. Uh, we can only instantiate in this matrix the arguments. That's actually an essential restriction, that this is a matrix. This restriction goes back to Hilbert um, and, and co-workers, um, but it's sometimes forgotten in literature. If we forget about this restriction, then there are dragons. So then bad things happen. Namely, then we cannot have a bound at all on the length of the hyperbolic junction. So suppose we drop this restriction, then it can be proven that there exists an existential formula, um, which is provable in this calculus, but we cannot show the existence of absolute free terms such that the elementary calculus proves this disjunction over these terms or sequences of terms and n is bounded in the size of p or in any measure of pi. So it just cannot exist. And in order to prove this, I use something called Yukami's trick. Namely, the point is that if we have this unbounded or this, this unrestricted absolute equality axioms, we can prove an unbounded schema of identity for arbitrary deep terms. And then we can construct a contradiction that we could eventually bound the term depth of the uh, of the instances of the extension form of this formula E, if we could have bounded the length of the Hebron disjunction. It just doesn't work. So we need this restriction. So coming back to the first absent theorem with absent equality. So suppose we have now these additional axioms, then we can still find absolute free terms dij and prove that this disjunction is provable in element calculus, calculus and we can have a bound on the lengths. This on, on a, and later on a bound on the hyper complexity. This bound is not as well, the, the old one, old bound is also not that nice, but this bound is slightly more complicated than the one before. So we have a tower of tools of height three times the critical count. So this is a donald metric function. And in the exponent, we have the critical count as before. And then we have something in blue. So it's the maximal um, progidial degree, uh, uh, pro maximal property degree, sorry, uh, which is a measure, a term measure on the epsilon matrices that we use in epsilon quality axioms. So let me try to explain how this works. We already know how to get rid of the critical axioms, but now we have these epsilon equality axioms in our language or in our proof. Again, for a specific epsilon term, there might be a whole bunch of this implication, and there might be also different formulas that we use in this equality, uh, different terms that we use in this equality. So how do we obtain a proof without these implications? So we 
produce derivations pi of the assumptions of this application, namely the quality li equals to ri, by replacing this term, epsilon term e here with the left hand side of this equality. Similar, we define uh, a proof where we have that all these equalities are false. Then we use a case distinction as before. And how does this work? Well, if we have that the left hand side of this equality and the right hand side are equal, then this becomes ontologies and can be derived from the assumed equality Li equals Ri. However, this destroys critical axioms. And that's the complication of this proof. Namely, we have to introduce suitable identity schemas of the form S equals T implies A of S equals AT that we can derive with luckily smaller epsilon terms. So this explains a bit the complication, but the point is, is that this maximal property degree here that we need in addition to the, let's go, let me go back here. The point that is that this max property degree here only depends on this newly introduced absolute equality action. So it's not um, relevant to the, critical, uh, to, the, to the critical count or the size of the proof. It's restricted to this additional complexity that comes by with this notion of equality for choice functions, or sort of choice function. Again, we have the result on the term depth um, of these instances. So again, we can use this trick on the term complexities. So there exists a primitive recursive function G and absolute free terms Tij, such that in this proof, the depth of these terms is bounded in G in the critical count, the maximum property degree and the logical degree, the complexity of the end formula. So the presence of the absolute quality axioms makes the elimination, elimination method much more involved and also made the complex analysis, so the analysis of the um, of the lengths of this or the, the, the bound on this end much more difficult. So I remember when I wrote this paper together with Richard more than 10 years ago, um, we already had some ideas to deal also with the case for equality. We didn't have Kenshi, so we weren't bright enough to figure out that we don't really need these absolute equality axioms to handle equality. And we tried to prove a similar result like this and we always fail to come up with a nice expression, which would only focus on the things that we have actually added to our epsilon calculus. But luckily now we have them. Good, so again, we have a bound on the hypercomplexity. So why do we need this, this formalism to bound, say something about the hypercomplexity, which only depends on the quantifier structure or quantifier inferences, and of course, on these epsilon matrices. Good. Okay. I promised 11 minutes I made. Uh, final remarks. I presented you two results in the hyper, on hypercomplexity, namely showed you a direct way to bound the hypercomplexity in the number of the quantifier inferences in the original proof. Of course, this can also be done in the sequence calculus, but I think the Epsilon calculus has some merits here because it gives you a direct technique. I showed you two results here, one where we have just equality and one we have this more complicated form of equality where I actually don't yet know where we can use it because we don't need it for the in embedding demo. Our lower bound, uh, upper bounds are not nice. So going back here, we have a non-elementary upper bound. We can have a non-elementary lower bound just formulating Statman's example directly. But then we, we kind of have a gap of for each tower of three twos, we have only one two in Statman's lower bound. So that there is a gap between the lower and the upper bound. And we have not yet found a better proof. But we have at least a lower bound result. Um, so open questions, which would at least for me be interesting, where how to close this gap in lower and upper bound and also find I have additional results on a sequential, a sequence calculus representation, not sequential sequence, sorry, um, 
like a system by means in the Azure R where the Epson calculus is represented in an LK-like system. But for this system, there is no syntactic cut elimination known. It's known the system is cut free complete, but only semantically. So we don't know yet how to prove um, for this variation of the Epson calculus using a sequence calculus proof or a sequence calculus representation, how to have a cut syntactic cut elimination, something which is open and which I would find interesting. Perhaps this gives us a more easy way to do these proofs than my argument that this is just bent bytecode and we don't really need to look at this. With this, I would just like to thank you for your attention.